Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the keynote session. So we have with us Professor Jyotsna Agarwal, who will be chairing the session. And we are have uh, we have two keynote speakers, Dr. Dharam Bhavak and Dr. Onam. So a brief introduction about them. Professor Jyotsna Agarwal, she is currently an associate professor at the Department of Clinical Psychology, National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore, from where she completed her MPhil and PhD. She is a consultant for several services in the institute, such as adult psychiatry, geriatric me medicine, positive psychology, and integral medicine, along with being the faculty in charge of Vipra, which stands for Vedic Indian Psychology Research and Application Division. Over to you, over to you, Dr. Jasleen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shilpa. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the keynote session. So we have with us Professor Jyotsna Agarwal, who will be chairing the session. And we are have, uh, we have two keynote speakers, Dr. Dharam Bhavak and Dr. Onam. So a brief introduction about them. Professor Jyotsna Agarwal, she is currently an associate professor at the Department of Clinical Psychology, National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore from where she completed her MPhil and PhD. She is a consultant for several services in the institute, such as adult psychiatry, geriatric me medicine, positive psychology, and integral medicine, along with being the faculty in charge of Vipra, which stands for Vedic Indian Psychology Research and Application Division, under which she runs two clinics, Sattva and Swasthya, for enhancing well-being. She was awarded the prestigious Fogarty International Postdoctoral Fellowship at Washington University School of Medicine, USA, and an other uh, postdoctoral fellowship at uh, Swasya Yoga University, Bangalore. Her research interests include Indian psychology, yoga and consciousness studies, positive psychology, preventive and promotive approaches towards mental health and psychotherapy. She is currently working on applications of Indian psychology and positive psychology in the clinical and community settings. A brief introduction about our keynote speaker, Dr. Dharam P.S. Bhavuk. Welcome, sir. He is a professor of management and culture and community psychology, University of Hawaii at Manoa, USA. His research interests include indigenous psychology and management, with focus on India and Nepal and cross-cultural training. He is the author of the book, Indian Psychology, Lessons from the Bhagavad Gita 2011 and co-editor of several other books. Dr. Bhavuk has published more than 100 papers and book chapters and made over 250 presentations internationally. He is a founding fellow of International Academy of Intercultural Research, Fellow of Indian Academy of Management, Foreign Fellow of National Academy of Psychology, India, and was X. Smith Richardson, Junior Visiting Fellow, Center for Creative Leadership, Greensboro, North Carolina, and recipients of many other awards. He has taught in China, New Zealand, and Nepal as a visiting professor. Our other keynote speaker for the session is Professor Dog Oman. Who, uh, who is a professor at the University of California at Berkeley School of Public Health, having taught there since 2001. His research focuses on positive factors in health and well-being, especially spirituality, religion, and meditation. He teaches on spirituality and public health, has directed a training program on the topic, and edited Why Religion and Spirituality Matter for Public Health, Evidence, Implications and Resources by Springer 2018. His 100 plus professional publications have ranged from epidemiologic studies of longevity to theoretical papers on learning from spiritual exemplars and empirical studies of mantram repetition. And he has led two randomized trials of spiritual meditation. He is a past president of the Society for the Psychology of Religion and Spirituality. He received the 2018 okay. William C. Beer Award for integrating the psychology of religion, spirituality with other disciplines. Over to you, ma'am, Professor Jyotsna Snagarwan. Thank you, Dr. Harleen. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, ma'am. 
Uh, I thank uh, Professor Kamlesh and your entire team for this wonderful program and uh, giving this opportunity to me to um, chair the session. Uh, both Professor Dog and uh, Professor Bhavok, both of them are very senior um, academicians who have contributed to the field immensely, especially in the area of dialogue between Indian perspective and the Western psychology. So as you see that till now, that the, that there is a very close flow between the earlier sessions and the current one. For example, the importance of the well-being, the importance of happiness, the importance of ideas about the peace also, which is like now, all of these are relevant in the sustainable development goals for 2030. And um, Professor Bhavuk would be speaking about them, and he has a wonderful way of bringing the nuances of each of these concepts, going in depth and looking at its like no, systematic connection between many of these concepts. Further, we look forward to Professor Oman's work in the area of uh, mindfulness and uh, Indian tradition and mantra, and etc. Who he has done a lot of work in this area. And in a way, if you see at a translation level, um, there's a lot of emphasis on how do we utilize these important concepts which we do in uh, like uh, academic and research in a small setting, how do we take it further to the larger population and improve their um, level of well-being. And this is especially important in the uh, world of like now uh, post-pandemic when the general level of well-being apparently like now uh, has come down and a lot of clinical issues are coming as we see the clinic. And um, also it uh, meets the uh, spiritual existential needs of human, which has been also like not triggered by the existential questions in this post-pandemic era. So I welcome uh, Professor Bhavuk first, and then we will um, have Professor Oman. You can keep your comments and questions in the chat box. Uh, we will um, take uh, after each session um, and maybe 10 minutes and then um, the next speaker in the uh, questions. And then in the end, if we have more time, we can take the questions for both of them. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Professor Bhavak, please. Welcome. Uh, is Professor Bhavak... Um... Pro Professor, unmute yourself. Please. Yeah. Can someone unmute him? Yes, this is Baruch. Uh, sir, can you please unmute yourself? You're actually muted. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can hear you. And can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Please go ahead. We, we are able to see so, the uh, short version. If you can okay. put it on full screen, that may help better. Okay. Okay. I, I'll do that. Right. Uh, to do that, I have to move this guy out of my way. One minute. Okay. Okay. Now I think you can see full screen. Yes. Now let me time myself for 30 minutes. Okay. Namaste. I am going to share this paper with you uh, where I basically derive the construct of Sukha uh, from the Bhagavad Gita. And 
Interestingly, uh, about five years ago, I was talking to a young scholar uh, who had who was sharing his work on happiness with me. And after he talked for 15, 20 minutes, I asked him, uh, did you talk to your respondents in English or what language? And he said, no, sir, in Hindi. And I said, and what did you ask them? What was the topic? I said, uh, did you talk about happiness or what? And he said, no, sir, Sukha. And I said, see now that completely changes everything for me. If you keep talking about happiness, I think of something else. And when you talk about Sukha, I think about something else. Uh, I hope in people in the audience can relate to this. <clears throat> and so my approach is uh, to basically understand the construct and to understand that we've got to, I mean, you can go and ask people, but we are fortunate that we have texts available that define the constructs that we use. And if you did not believe it, uh, Sukha is present in text, and this is really a technical term in a lot of our uh, tradition. So the, uh, I will not be able to talk about Anandam and Shanti a lot. I'll basically focus on Sukha, uh, but Shanti appears once uh, in defining Sukha, so there is, there is some connection. You've seen the abstract, so, so I'll briefly share the methodology then talk about Sukha in the Bhagavad Gita uh, and you know, talk about the 30 themes and the categories that emerge from that and then summarize it. <clears throat> the approach I take is for any construct, we should go through all the verses in a text. So Bhagavad Gita is fortunately uh, big, but not that big. So there are 700 verses and you can actually go through them and identify the word or construct that you are interested in. So that's the, that's the procedure. And then analyze all the verses and then from then identify the theme and cluster the themes. Uh, I have used this method, I've been using this methodology for uh, 20 years, and uh, uh, at least there is one student who has used the methodology in in Baroda, and uh, she has she has you know she has found it useful. Uh, Sukha appears in the Bhagavad Gita 35 times in 34 verses, so I will not I do not need to uh, read the number of the verses, but it appears in cha first chapter, second chapter, not in third. Canto, which is on Karma Yoga, but then on fourth, fifth, sixth, and then again not in not on seventh, not in seventh, um, and then in seven, eight, nine, it doesn't appear, and then once in tenth, uh, once in twelfth, and um, then again thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeenth, it does not appear. Again, I will not uh, talk about uh, dukkha, but dukkha appears eighteen times, and sukha dukkha appear. Uh, at least four or five times together, and you will see that. So in the first chapter, uh, Arjuna is not happy about the battle. <clears throat> and so he tells Sri Krishna, na kaang che vijayang Krishna, na cha rajyang sukha nicha, king no rajye na govinda, kim bhogair jivite nava, so in these two verses, we find uh, Arjun is saying that he doesn't want to fight the battle. Uh, he doesn't want he doesn't want the rajya or the kingdom. He doesn't want dhana or wealth. He does not want vijay or victory. So, uh, and he does not, what is the point of all these bhogas? So all these, you know, pleasurable things. If 
he is going to fight his relatives. So we see in these verses that uh, Sukha has tangibles like dhan and rajya. Kingdom is concrete. Dhan is wealth is concrete. Uh, but, all, but it also has socially constructed concept like vijaya. Because, you know, victory uh, and defeat can be defined. Uh, we can define, you know, what we think victory now, we can define as non-victory, uh, and then it would mean that. So there are both tangibles and socially constructed elements of Sukha. Uh, I do a prayer uh, of uh, Lakshmi uh, Mata, which is done by none other than the king of gods, Indra. And the prayer ends with these, uh, these three, uh, one, two, three, these three verses. Rajyang Dehi, Shriyang Dehi, Balang Dehi, Sureshwari, Kirting Dehi, Dhanang Dehi, Yasho Mahyang Chadehi, Dehi Vai, Kamang Dehi, Mating Dehi, Bhogan Dehi, Hari Priye, Nyanang Dehi, Chadharmang Cha, Sarva Saubhagyam Ipsitam. Prabhavangcha, Pratapangcha, Sarvadhikaram Evacha, Jayam Parakramam Yudhe, Parmaishwaryam Evacha. So if a king were to be asking for boons or blessing, what would he or a queen she ask? And here we see that there are a lot of socially constructed uh, words like Vijay, Shriyam, Kirtim, Yashaha, Bhoga, Saubhagya, uh, Pratap, Prabhav, uh, Adhikar or Sarvadhikar, Parakrama, Aishwarya, and the tangibles still remain Dhana, Rajya, and I think strength or bulk is tangible. We can measure it in some, you know, in some quantified way. I brought this basically to uh, provide the context that uh, these are some of the other intangibles that people seek. And when we seek something, it will become clear. It does give us pleasure or joy or happiness. So the first theme uh, appears that uh, Sukha has both tangible and intangible. And those of you who are a marketing researcher, you will immediately connect to um, customer service as having tangible and intangibles. So Sukha has both components. It's not only an abstract construct, it goes with some tangibles. In verse 37, uh, this is Arjun continues to uh, express himself. How can I be happy by killing my family members? So killing Swajana, my own people. Swa is self, Jana is people, my people. Killing my people does not give Sukha. So killing and Sukha do not go together. So this become, this emerges as a theme. Aho bat mahat papang kartum vyavasita vayam yad rajya sukha lobhena hantum swajanam udyataha. So we see rajya and uh, appears again. But here we see the connection that sukha can cause lobh. So Rajya Sukh Lovena. So Sukh can be a cause of love or greed. So those are the themes that come from uh, the first canto. In the second canto, we start getting some interesting other ideas. So in verse 14, now Sri Krishna is telling Arjuna, so here we see an interesting uh, conceptualization. So sparsh is contact or touching and matra is refers to uh, the five measurable 
areas of our five senses. So the eye and vision. So vision would be a matra. Uh, taste would be a matra. Uh, hearing would be a matra. So there are five senses and they connect to five different parts of prakriti or the world. So when the senses come in contact with what they go to, then there is matra sparsha, shita ushana. There is, we feel cold or hot. We also feel sukha, dukha. So here we see a clear definition of what is sukha or the antecedent of sukha. Our senses come in contact with something and that may give, give us either happiness or sorrow, sukha or dukha. Now, this is going to keep coming back in the Bhagavad Gita and in the fifth canto, Sri Krishna says, yehi sansparsha jabhoga dukha yonaya evate adyantavantah kaunteya and so we are not going to get uh, uh, deeper into this, but this sansparsha jabhoga, so with touching and seeing and, you know, tasting and hearing, we get sensations, some, you know, pleasurable, unpleasurable feelings, and the wise ones don't get attached to this. So this will come back again as a theme but at this point, I just wanted to connect it with how our senses give us sukha. So antecedent of sukha is senses. In 2.32, Sri Krishna tells Arjuna, yadrikshaya chopa pannam swargadwaram apavritam sukhina kshatriyaha partha lavante yuddham idrisham. So Adi Shankara translates Sukhina as Punyavanta. So those, and so now this gives us uh, Sukha, leads to Sukhina, one who has Sukha, and uh, it's connected then to Punya or meritorious or virtuous work. So Sukha becomes Punya, and then also here we have a social construction from our culture that for a Kshatriya, uh, battle is and a rightful battle is opens the door to swarga and swarga is where we have only pleasurable things so sukha is connected to swarga and sukha is connected to punya so these uh, we get these two themes from these verses in in 238 Sri krishna says sukha dukhe same kritva labha labha jaya jayau Tato yuddhaya yujyasva naivam papam avapsyasi. So here we, uh, he gives sukha dukha, lava alava or gain loss, jaya ajaya or success failure. And so basically sukha with dukha is a type of duality. So now we are getting uh, how sukha is directly related to dukha. And if we are only going to study happiness, probably we are not going to get the full picture. Uh, and I is guilty and charged. I'm only talking about Sukha, but I did mention you that Dukha is mentioned 18 times. And Dukha has already started coming in the context of, of Sukha. So Sukha with Dukha is a type of duality. And it also provides us a, a methodology of how to live in the world, act in a balanced way, in Sukha and Dukha or in all dualities. So this, this becomes the path of Karma Yoga and this becomes a theme and we'll see that the other paths of Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga and Dhyana Yoga will also appear with Sukha Dukha and balancing them. <clears throat> in verse 256, Sri Krishna says, Dukheshu anudvigna manaha Sukheshu vigatas prihaha vitaraga bhaya krodhaha stit dhihi muni uchete. So here we get this idea that dukha, unhappiness, 
makes our manas udvigna or disturbed and sukha makes our manas desire more of it. Spriha is wanting more. It can also be interpreted to be lov, lova, which we have seen earlier, that sukha and lova are connected. And what we and this is the definition of sthitadhi or sthit pragya. So this gives us a, a very important insight that sukha is something that we need to understand to be able to understand what sthit pragyata means, what sthit dhi means. So a person who is balanced, whose buddhi is balanced, whose manas is in balance, does not get disturbed by dukha and does not get attracted to sukha. So this provides us you know, an interesting perspective. So we learn two things here, that sukha and spriha are connected and that to be sthit pragya, we need to balance sukha dukha and other dualities. In 257, Sri Krishna says, Yah sad sarvatra anavisneha tat tat prapya shubha or shubham na abhinandati na dueshti tasya pranya pratishtita. So we are, he is still talking about sit pragya. And here we get some insight about how sukha is related to shubha. So what is auspicious gives us sukha. Uh, sneha or avisneha uh, attached uh, affection. So sukha and affection are related. And avinandana, nandan is joy. Nandan also means son. Nandani means daughter. So son or and daughter give us joy, give us sukha. And that's why, uh, so shubha, avisneha, avinandana, these words, these constructs are related to sukha. And then it also, he also says, Sthit Pragya is one who goes beyond Abhinandana and Dvesha, desire and dislike. So uh, there are about 10 verses that define different aspects of what Sthit Pragya means, what being in harmony means. And we can see that Sukha is a part of that. Finally, in verse 266 in Canto 2, Sri Krishna says, Nasti buddhi ayuktasya, nacha ayuktasya bhavana, nacha abhavayataha shanti, ashantasya kutaha sukham. So this, this, is, this is really a, a complex, a rich construct laden verse where we have ayukta, buddhi, abhavana, but then all of that leads to ashanti. And ashanti, not peace, means we cannot have sukha. So here we see shanti and sukha are connected. And shanti or peace is an antecedent of sukha. So we are not only getting different hues of the construct, different meanings of the construct as we go through the verses, but now we are also getting the antecedents of sukha. And we'll see that uh, later in verse 512, uh, yukta and ayukta are defined. So Bhagavad Gita is a beautiful text where if we make effort, we can define the constructs that are presented in different verses uh, by going through all the 700 verses. And this is really beautiful. So ayukta is one who, is, who gives up the karma phala. And that person, and uh, achieves peace. So, and Ayukta is the opposite of that. In Canto 4, we have only one verse, but it's a very interesting verse. And I have uh, used this verse uh, in my paper on Shraddha because it uses the word Shraddha, uh, but it also uses Sukha. Angyascha ashraddhanascha samshaya atma vinashyati na ayam loko asti na paro na sukham samshaya atmanaha. So one who has doubt does not find peace, does not find in this world 
and does not find happiness or sukha. But this is the samshaya atma, the one who is doubtful, is preceded by two other constructs. Bhangya, one who does not know, and of course Bhagavad Gita defines that, and Ashraddha, one who does not have Shraddha, and I don't want to define Shraddha as faith, there's, there's a you know, much richer description, but if you're looking for one quick word, then you may use uh, faith. Uh, so, Agya Ashraddhana Samshaya Atma has no Sukha. So now we are getting uh, three defined, three constructs that define who gets Sukha and who does not get Sukha. So these become kind of the antecedents of Sukha. Nyeya sa nitya sanyasi yona dvesti na kangshati nirdvandohi mahabaho sukham bandhat pramuchyate. One who is beyond dvandva goes beyond the bondage of Sukha. So here now we are getting a method of uh, how to go, how to achieve Sukha. How can we experience Sukha? We need to go be beyond duality. And of course, many dualities are uh, mentioned in the previous verses we saw. So Sukha Dukha is duality, Man Apman is duality, and so, and so, uh, and so forth. In verse 13, Sri Krishna says, Sarva karmani manasa sannyasya aste shukhambashi navadware pure dehi naiva kurvan nakarayan. So renunciation of all action causes sukha. Now, this is a definition that uh, is kind of consistent, not kind of, it is consistent. It is used for all the paths that the Bhagavad Gita talks about. So for karma yoga, for bhakti yoga, for jnana yoga, for jnana yoga, for raj yoga, uh, for all of them. So they all provide you sukha. Uh, so all these paths lead to sukha and renunciation of all actions causes sukha is one definition that we get in this verse. Uh, such a person who is in complete control of the senses, uh, vashi, in sukha, neither does anything nor gets anything done so this is this is this is a fascinating and beautiful verse with a lot of meaning in 521 uh, sri krishna says akshayam so one who you know pulls himself inside experiences uh, the highest form of sukha. And so now we kind of see here that sukha gets degrees. Uh, so there, is, there are many degrees of sukha and this refers to the highest level of sukha. So sukha is, is in self when detached to, from the five external senses and detachment to, to senses makes one Brahma Yoga Yukta Brahma Yoga Yukta Atma, or the person who is who is you know uh, connected with Brahma and not connected with the material world. In uh, five twenty three, Sri Krishna says, "Saknoti ihaivaya shodhum prakshadir vimokshanat kam krod udbhavam vegam." So yukta, so sukhi nara. So here he defines who is yukta and who is sukhi. So we are getting two words here, but he says the person is one who has control over the senses. So two, to have sukha, we must have control on senses. Now this is where there is a little bit of counterintuitiveness because sukha. See, one definition would be where the senses find pleasure, but here it is controlling the senses that will provide sukha is given as a definition. 
जितात्मन प्रशात परमात्मा सहित सित उष्ण सुख दुखेशु तथा मानापमान सो हियर वी गेट अ डेफिनेशन verses 6 7 to 6 11 present the qualities of a yogi which is similar to the okay that is my alarm to say that i am out of time so verse 6.7 to 6 11 present the qualities of a yogi which is similar to the qualities of sthit pragya or a bhakta all rise above sukha dukha and other dualities <clears throat> so you know continuing with these themes uh, we get so i'm going to now you know go through this rather quickly in a minute <clears throat> so we get uh, the sthit pragya and the bhakta the devotee and the karma yogi and the gnani yogi they all have to rise above sukha and dukha that becomes a theme and then in uh, 621 uh, the yogi a yogi experiences atyantikam sukham so there is a degree of sukha and of the highest kind uh, in 627 again we talk about the yogi and if you are in the manas is quiet and calm then you experience sukha so it provides a a perspective uh, in canto 10 basically we get a list of qualities that is uh, that provides sukha or happiness uh, or or we can say sukha is in a nomological network of so many other qualities or virtues let me go that that's some that's some fancy ways of looking at <laughs> at uh, 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 sukha Uh, but let me go to the final uh, slides where we have the summary uh, so we get the the so sukha has tangible and socially constructed elements a uh, sukha springs from krishna himself he says in 104 and sukha uh, in sankhya darshan it is the purush who is the bhokta of sukha so we get so uh, and then uh, who is sukhi then we get about six characteristics of who sukhi is who is happy and we get types of sukha and so you know uh, we get six types of sukha and satvik rajasik tamasik are the major categories but we get three others from there and sukha and other constructs so this is what we have seen so sukha and punya sukha and swarga sukha and dukha sukha and prihas uh, sukha and raga so many other constructs are related to sukha the antecedent of sukha are the senses uh, and then ayukta abuddhi abhavana ashanta these are people who don't get sukha renunciates of all, of all action causes sukha Uh, killing swajana does not give sukha so this comes out in that and then finally uh, a yogi rises above sukha and dukha and that applies to karma yogi raj yogi bhogi uh, sorry bhakti yogi and everybody and act in a balanced way in sukha dukha so that's karma yoga that came in 232 so we see that we have a construct we have so three verses talk about what is sukha seven verses talk about who is sukhi or who is not sukhi uh, then we have the construct in a nomological network so sukha and other constructs are related in nine verses uh, the antecedent of sukha is given in three verses and how can we go beyond sukha is presented in two verses so this provides us a rich concept of what sukha is and uh, we all understand sukha because we know the language but there is is uh, more than a simple mm-hmm. word meaning for the construct itself i think i can stop there thank you for your patience thank you professor bhavuk for such a wonderful and in depth description of sukha from bhagavad gita perspective and um, 
when you were singing the verses of Bhagavad Gita, I think everyone's mind became silent. So I don't see any questions coming um, till now. So maybe if we want, we can also go to um, Professor Oman's uh, session. And then in the end, we will have 20 minutes for questions for both of you. Is that OK? Sure. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So I invite Professor Oman. Um, he also has PowerPoint. So uh, Professor Bhavo, I request you to stop sharing the slides and Professor Oman can upload. And I request the audience to think through uh, the, this in-depth, beautiful description of Sukha and it's uh, like a connection with a variety of other concepts. Even I have a couple of questions. So I'll <laughs> ask in the end and uh, you can all ask in the chat box. And then I invite Professor Oman to uh, start his presentation. Uh, welcome Professor Oman. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I'm a great honor to be able to join you, and I'm I'm, I'm really privileged. Thank you. Um, can you can you hear me? And can you see uh, my slides that I projected? A first slide. We can see you. We can't see your slides yet. Okay. Uh, oh, maybe I didn't click share yet. Yeah, it's coming. Yes, we can see now we can see. Okay, very good. One. Thank you. And it looks like it's the okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um uh, this uh this talk is uh, my title is Positive Psychology, Mindfulness and Public Health. And as you'll see, um I'm talking a lot about mindfulness as it's taken on meaning in psychology, but that doesn't mean that I'm espousing that as the last word or even necessarily a, a terribly profound word on what mindfulness is. So in the middle of this talk, we will be, um, you will see that there is a lot of uh, concern for finding uh, in indigenous versions that might match or some. Um, so I wanted to mention that at first. And um, a lot of this talk is based on um, it, or derives from my position the last 20 years has been, as the presenters were mentioning earlier, in the School of Public Health. So um, this is, a lot of this is from a a, a public health perspective. Okay, let's see if, okay, did, did that advance? Can you see my outline there? Yes, we can see. Something. Okay, very good. So this, my talk here, my slides will be in three main parts. First is an introduction, sort of defining the terms. And then the second will be a critical analysis of mindfulness and public health. And that is largely derived from a paper that is in press at the moment, but will be out within 24 hours because I, a few days ago, I sent in the last proof corrections. The production editor at Springer said that it should be published within 24 hours. Uh, and I have somewhere, well, I will send it through the chat, uh, the uh, the DOI so that people can actually look at the paper uh, because all I'm gonna really be able to do here is give some highlights, uh, but this, uh, well, I'll, I'll say a bit more about this. Anyway, I'll give this critical analysis and then at the end, some uh, talk just very briefly about some questions and implications for positive psychology. And I have quite a bit to say, so I think I'll just go on through and uh, talking kind of fast probably. <laughs> Okay, so um, hey, the first part, uh, defining our terms, um, mindfulness and public health in relation to psychology. First, I'll be talking about, well, what are we talking about here in terms of public health? What is mindfulness? And, and then can mindfulness become part of public health? And I think that 
relates to what previous speakers have been saying about doing positive psychology in this larger context of complexity and world needs and, and so on and so forth. And we're all interconnected in our post-pandemic age, even as we were before. Okay, so public health. What are we talking about public health? Well, uh, we can turn to the World Health Organization uh, for, uh, in, that's what I've done in this critical analysis. Uh, public health uh, can refer to all organized efforts of society to prevent disease, promote health, and prolong life among the population as a whole. So focusing on the population as a whole rather than individuals. And this, so it's this collective level that perhaps is, is uh, different than in the earlier stages of positive psychology. And it's worth pointing out that the World Health Organization Constitution since 1948 has had in there in its constitution a, a positive, or at least a definition of health that recognizes the positive dimensions that it's well-being and not merely the absence of disease. So it would include Sukha, who knows, maybe maybe even Ananda. I don't know if World Health Organization has talked about that. But anyway, okay. So another term, public health and positive psychology. How do those relate to each other? Well, uh, here's a quote from uh, Martin Levin article in American Journal of Public Health. It, so uh, it does, you know, he's advocating for the relevance of, of positive psychology to public health, to health promotion, to all these, all these positive connections. So it seems that public health, uh, stimulated by papers like this, has been taking paying a little bit of attention to positive psychology, but arguably it should be paying more attention. But anyway, we're uh, my talk is not the first to be drawing these connections, okay? Now, in this picture, it's worth mentioning the field of epidemiology. That will be coming up later in my analysis. And uh, uh, epidemiology is a study of the population patterning of health and disease and their causes. And it's said to be the basic science of public health. And so uh, can we have a, po a positive epidemiology? Most epidemiology has been studying uh, risk factors for diseases. So kind of a, a double negative. But lately, uh, people, uh, here's an example. Here's uh, maybe the, the most forceful advocacy of it. Uh, Vanderweel and colleagues in the eminent journal Epidemiology have a paper uh, from three years ago called Positive Epidemiology. They say we need a positive epidemiology that takes as its object not only disease, but health in its fullest sense, and to understand the full range of health assets. So, so again, uh, not only public health as a whole in practice, but also even the, the, the uh, basic science of public health epidemiology is starting to converge with a positive psychology perspective. Okay, now coming over to another one of our basic terms here in this analysis, what is mindfulness? Okay, I just warned that I'm not taking at face value um, that, my, that the Western meaning is, is necessarily the meaning with the most interest. But in terms of what's in the psychology literature, uh, what has become dominant in this whole, as you can see from that graph there in the upper right, what has become uh, uh, dominant meaning in publications that, as you can see, are exponentially growing since about 2006 or something uh, in mindfulness uh, is uh, our mindfulness-based interventions, MBIs. Uh, they're this growing topic in psychology, and much of that has been catalyzed by what probably, I, I would guess that most people in our audience have heard of John Kabat-Zinn's uh, program, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which he, he uh, pioneered in a pain reduction clinic in a medical center in Massachusetts. Uh, it, it's often presented in an eight-week program. It teaches things like uh, a kind of sitting meditation 
it often includes uh, yoga asanas, uh, postures. Uh, it includes uh, uh, informal methods used throughout the day to uh, recenter oneself, such as attending to the breath, uh, cultivating some attitudes, and also sort of an origin story for, well, where does our suffering come from? And are there ways to uh, escape some of it? Is some of it unnecessary? And an advocacy of disidentifying with thoughts, which maybe maybe even has some convergences with things other speakers have been talking about. So this uh, program, it started out uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction started out in a uh, medical center in the healthcare sector, but since then it's spread to places like workplaces, schools, and so on, where this mindfulness-based stress reduction or, or other similar adaptations have been offered. So across sectors, turns out that converges with a public health perspective, where public health often tries to reach people through many different sectors in society to uh, to vaccinate them or all habits of various kinds, so on and so forth. So what is the basis or core of this, this very, very influential program? It uh, Well, uh, the definition, I, I don't really have time to go into that a lot, but what I do want to mention here is that the there are different ways to look at what the actual basis is. Uh, it, everybody knows what it is, but what is the core of it? What is the essence of it? Uh, according to the establishment view, so to speak, is that it's all based on a definition of mindfulness, which many people have pointed out is discrepant from traditional Buddhist uh, um, definitions of mindfulness, even though it it is, uh, derived from them, so to speak. Uh, this is an influential definition that's all over the literature that mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally, and that that is a, a common thread running through those elements, that those elements are teaching how to do that. Well, a slightly different view that I won't really try to resolve here is that and this is from a colleague at Berkeley, Eleanor Roche, who did participant in, uh, observation studies of what is actually happening in uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction classes. Uh, among her qualifications, she, it's not widely known, but when she was quite, uh, when she was a young adult, she was a Buddhist nun for about a year in a Tibetan tradition. So she has some perspectives on what mindfulness is. And she, uh, her view of MBSR and programs is that it's a potpourri, so is her word, of potentially beneficial practices, uh, each with possible application. Well, the mindfulness itself is a question rather than affirm that we need not be intimidated by necessarily by what the developers say is going on. There, it may be there's something else going on. And so we should think ourselves about what may be the best uh, way to harness similar types of healing processes in any context. Okay, how does this field of mindfulness with all these burgeoning publications, how does it uh, fit into positive psychology? Well, Stress reduction sounds negative, but many practices are positive. Uh, a, uh, there was a systematic review of what uh, the authors called uh, mindfulness-based positive psychology interventions. They found uh, about 20 uh, in general and two in clinical samples, 105 different positive outcomes have been studied, contexts such as uh, psychotherapies, uh, interventions for children, mindfulness apps, and so on. I suspect uh, it's probably more than that. But anyway, they they identified already quite a number of studies. There's also been books here uh, on uh, uh, mindfulness and positive psychology. Okay, so uh, what, I, what I think we can do then is uh, view mindfulness as part of positive psychology, maybe one part, maybe with a little, a slightly different history that uh, predates the launch of the positive psychology field itself. And I'm going to think of this as a 
or, or one way of looking at my uh, critical analysis is looking at can this one aspect of positive psychology, what's needed for it to be taken up into public health on a, on a high, uh, and, and used on the population level rather than primarily on a clinical or individual level. Okay, so it looks like uh, mindfulness should be very promising for public health. There is a, a research base showing many, many individual benefits. So you would think it could also promote population health and resilience. For example, a colleague uh, after a cyclone in the Philippines, she went there and she did lots of trainings uh, after that cyclone to various mental health professionals in both the um, uh, both the uh, Christian and the Muslim areas, teaching them mindfulness that was they were then able to use to help people with all the mental health challenges that were left as as the society was recovering from the cyclone. So maybe there are important roles uh, uh, if if we can you know uh, that mindfulness or something similar could serve for public health. Uh, so, moreover, there is a promising alignment on a kind of a prevention orientation recognition of the importance of mental health and, and stress processes, stress and resilience, and a multi-sectoral orientation that I mentioned earlier. So lots of promise. But when you actually look at the literature, turns out in the top public health journals, mindfulness is essentially absent uh, from the top tier journals and most of the other uh, tiers too. So what's what's going on? Uh, where is the problem? So that was kind of a catalyzing influence for my analysis here. Uh, I already had some ideas, of course, but I got systematic about it. And this is the paper that's about to come out. I can be sending you all that, DO, that uh, DOI. And so uh, it poses a question, would public health benefit by more use of mindfulness? What are the opportunities and barriers? And the approach that I use is to analyze 14 axes or dimensions of potential alignment or tension to see where we're, where the two fields are lined up, the two fields of public health and mindfulness, and where they're in tension, or maybe where mindfulness is, where there's something that makes it hard for mindfulness to be taken up. And the conclusion, I'll you know, tip my hand, is that there, there are a few areas, several areas, where mindfulness lags public health. And, and these include epidemiologic base and cultural adaptation, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, and implications being there's some research that's needed and also perhaps reframe the promise of mindfulness, which I think will uh, be especially meaningful to the readers of the journal where the article is coming out, the mindfulness journal, may be less meaningful for all, all of us. But on the other hand, if if there is a slightly different, um, a uh, approach that the mindfulness movement needs to take in order to uh, uh, facilitate uptake in public health, then that would be of interest maybe to everyone. And oh, here's just a quick view of the paper, which will be open access. This is what the paper looks like. Here's the paper's version of those 14 axes of comparison. You can hardly read it. So I will show it to you this way, which maybe is a little bit more readable. Now there are these 14 dimensions, that's too many to talk about each one. So what I'm gonna aim to do here uh, is take for granted, I've, I think I've already mentioned these kind of foundational ways that the two fields are aligned, that shows there should be promise. And then look at selected highlights from the rest of the analysis, about five or so different selected highlights that show maybe some of the key ideas, some of the tensions, some of the further resonance that already has been achieved. Okay, so I'll just, um, as I say, I've got a lot to say, so I'm just gonna, just gonna keep, keep uh, moving here, plunge right into these without even trying to give you an overview. One is epidemiologic foundations is one of the key ideas. Uh, and um, so often in these axes, and now in looking at each one of these axes or comparisons, I look first at what's happening in public health. And in public health, there are certain not positive non-psychological factors that have been studied in epidemiology, in the basic science of public health, 
such as, for example, good nutrition supports public health, physical activity, you know, not being inactive, uh, study uh, supports health, uh, social support um, uh, is more social than, well, it's also psychological, but it's also social, that supports public health. So those are well studied in public health. They, there's been a lot of look at the risk patterning in general population specific populations, you know, study of which populations may have lowest levels of these things to identify who's at the most, which populations are at the most risk, and maybe uh, there needs to be public health effort or funding to, to work with those populations, especially that sort of thing. In order to do these kind of studies, uh, you need measures to assess the levels of the population risk and protection factors. And then this knowledge informs uh, public health priorities and policies. So what the analogous situation with regard to influence. Have there been epidemiological foundations built for mindfulness in the sense, of, turns out there has been very little study of patterning in community samples. It's mostly, you know, randomized trials of, you know, many different variations, but little, there are just a couple of exceptions I found. So very, very rare to study the patterning in populations. So maybe this is one reason why there hasn't been uh, uh, uptake in the public health. Uh, another problem, which maybe a lot of you are aware of, is that the mindful measures have doubtful face validity, that you know they don't seem to correspond with what's really in uh, definitions in Buddhism. They're, they don't necessarily even correspond with what with John Kabat-Zinn's definition. So basically, one can say that mindfulness mostly lacks an epidemiologic foundation, the, the mindfulness literature, that is. Not the, not the idea, but the literature. OK, moving on to another one of my highlighted ideas. Going to keep moving here, lest, lest run out of time for talk or the questions. Here's another highlighted idea, attentional health. Uh, the concept for individuals and environments. So let's put this into context. The World Health Organization uh, and much of other public health refers to different health facets or facets of, of human health, which include mental health, physical health, social health. So which facet of, of health does mindfulness is mindfulness a part of this? Could we think of it as, well, you can't have good such and such type of health unless you have some of these strengths that mindfulness talks about? Well, um, uh, it turns out that for these more established, better recognized facets of health, uh, each health facet may be cultivated in many ways. For example, physical health can be cultivated through walking or swimming, or maybe uh, people whose work involves a lot of activity, if they're farmers or doing brave le bread labor or other physically active um, activities, uh, that would be maybe one way to, to keep the, the, to give themselves physical exercise. Uh, and the, the same can be said for um, uh, mental health and social health, that there, there are various things that help help support it. And each one of these facets is affected by physical, biological, and social environments. Uh, and, and that you can have risk factors and protective factors in each of those environments, as well as within an individual. So what's the mindfulness situation? Have we do we have a good understanding of what uh, what facet of health it belongs to? Well, I guess obviously it's it's maybe a little bit more aligned with mental health than with physical health. Uh, but I I argue that there's that it can we can be more refined about that. There has been some talk, and my paper cite references, of something called attentional health, that 
people's attention can be scattered, fragmented, uh, or you know, distracted or heading in the wrong direction, upset. You know, there can be lots of ways that attention can be not working very well, uh, working against us, so to speak. And I would argue that a a better way of thinking about mindfulness, maybe a more specific way, would be that it's in this understudied strand of mental health that we might call attentional health. And that would open up the door to including other uh, aspects of attentional health, not just some, not just an analog of uh, Buddhist mindfulness, which in Sanskrit would be smirti, but also uh, other aspects of attention, such as concentration, that can uh, to be fully attentionally healthy, doesn't a person need a certain degree of ability to concentrate? Or in Sanskrit, you might call it akagrata. Um, so anyway, there's there is a much uh, fuller discussion of this in the paper. So this uh, I'm trying to touch on a number of highlights, pique your interest, but also give you a sense of the overall drift of the analysis. So in fact, uh, this notion of attentional health perhaps can help us reframe those mindfulness measures, which are widely criticized as lacking validity. Maybe if we think of them, not necessarily as measures of mindfulness, but maybe aspects of attentional health, maybe that's a more useful way of thinking about them. And that includes the uh, 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 mindful attention and awareness scale, which I think was the first out of the books. Maybe some of you have used some of those measures, I'm not sure. And of course, thinking about attentional health uh, begs asking, what is the role of the attentional environments that we're all immersed in? Or arguably, uh, all of these other environments, the physical, biological, and social environments, they all impinge on our attention, tend to direct our attention in certain ways, or have it be regulated in certain ways. And I think we all experience this through social media. There's really widespread discussion of people uh, feeling, at least among, at least over here in the US, I hear many, many people saying, gee, I feel like I can't concentrate the way I used to. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of real concern there, uh, which I, I don't really have time to go into now, uh, but this leads to another topic that it's long been a public health best practice to intervene at multiple levels. In other words, uh, if you want people to have, for example, good nutrition, you not only try to educate them about ways they, you know, ways to eat healthy foods, but also make sure that healthy foods are available to them in their environment. That if they live in a certain neighborhood, that the that the the stores or vendors in that neighborhood sell healthy food. And similarly, if you're going to encourage people to uh, engage in exercise, physical exercise, you want it to be safe. You want them to not live in crime-ridden neighborhoods. You want it to be safe enough to actually get exercise. You want there to be sidewalks if possible. I, I imagine the details of this play out differently in uh, a country like the US versus India. But anyway, I think the, the overall concept that one should be aware of both the social level and the individual level is, is probably valid everywhere. And so uh, that's been long been a best practice in public health. So have mindfulness interventions, have they been uh, carried out trying to intervene in the social environment too, to ensure that there aren't things undermining mindfulness in the social environment, such as, you know, too many social media or social media is too invasive, too many uh, emails coming in at all time, reminders, you know, I... As soon as I get started on something, I'm distracted 90 seconds later. You know. So it turns out that mindfulness interventions are only very rarely multi-level. I found one example of it where there was a, a workplace intervention that used mindfulness for individuals, but also did something in the, in the environment. Uh, 
Now, what can you do on the collective level? Well, maybe the most memorable example here is that to promote a family, a healthy family attentional environment, some countries such as France have, uh, have enacted what they call a right to disconnect law that, that employers cannot contact employees with demands that they do this or that work, you know, during off hours, like maybe in France, it's after 5 p.m. I think again here, this may, the details or the, may play out differently in different countries that, you know, are different places in the global economy, different local economies. But I think the principle is the same of trying to pay attention to that collective environment, maybe trying to defend, uh, you know, protect, strengthen the family intentional environment by, by uh, mitigating intrusions from other places. So that one example is these right to get disconnect laws. Perhaps another, and this is a complicated, can't really go into this, is to reform social media so that it's less predatory on our attention. I'm sort of assuming that you know what I'm talking about, but if not, there's a lot in the paper. And here's, a, here's sort of a provocative quote from one of the, that I quote in the paper, that it, it turns out that social media is designed to capture our attention and glue it, hold that web designers, app designers, they're all trying to get us to use their product as, as continuously as possible because that's where advertising dollars come from. So here's a provocative um, quote saying at the moment, it, it's as if we're all having itching powder uh, poured on us that distracts us. And, uh, and it's, it's not enough just to say, oh, you should learn to meditate or whatever, then you wouldn't scratch so much. We should actually try to reform that social environment, so to speak, to metaphorically have people stop pouring the itching powder on us. It may, it may be hard to imagine that at this point. Maybe we're so immersed in it, but I think it is imaginable to uh, reform even social media. Okay, so, well, here we go, marching from one big idea to another. Probably this is a lot to take in. So anyway, I, uh, but I'm hoping I'm piquing your interest somewhere along the line. So cultural adaptation needed. Well, ac uh, across the health and human service professions in psychology and positive psychology, we've we beneficially heard people, em earlier speakers this morning emphasizing it that it's important to be uh, sensitive to cultural factors and adapt and maybe draw upon and rely upon uh, local cultural factors. That's pervasive, at least as an ideal across health and human service professions. And so this actually raises quite a number of issues in uh, mindfulness literature. And I imagine uh, analogous issues from maybe any other positive psychology intervention would be adapting interventions and how are they administered in local local uh, uh, healthcare environments uh, religious traditions how do they match up with religious uh, sensitivities as well as religious resources local in psychology and then professional competence and training I know uh, professor Bawuk has done a, a good deal of uh, work on uh, 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 training handbook of uh, cultural translation, I, I think may be the title. Uh, so we have some experts right here. So there are quite a number of issues. And I tried to analyze how they play out again in mindfulness, looking at the literature. So it turns out, uh, well, it's probably not too surprising that most of the research and the uptake is mainly but not exclusively in Euro American population. So maybe it's an open question whether current interventions are really, you know, how applicable are they in uh, other places such as India or Africa? There, there's been explicit literature questioning how relevant it might be for Africa, but not, not for closing it, not saying it's totally irrelevant, but saying maybe more cultural adaptation, more religious adaptation is uh, needed. Uh, sorry but to unfortunately, interrupt. Uh... Professor Oman, uh, we are running oh, short you. of time, okay. so you can. Okay, okay. Turns out that it's been muted, uh, but there's a lot of work, uh, beneficial 
uh, ways to address that. Uh, a final issue, I notice we have some uh, people here from the business world, is how should mindfulness be branded, so to speak? And I'd like to point out that for decades, public health has employed public health branding in health promotion campaigns. So there is some interesting points of comparison there. What I end up arguing is that maybe instead of just calling it mindfulness, we can simultaneously, when, especially if we're using local adaptations, call it by other names that, that maybe resonate better with local ears and are more inclusive and open. Um, and all, as well as substituting the local practices. Okay, I think mindfulness itself may need to be um, rethought, reframed what the promise of the mindfulness movement is. And the positive psychology application I'd see is that this here, what I've just been presenting, could be thought of positive psychology into public health. And one question I would ask, do other positive psychology topics need, for example, an epidemiologic base? What is attentional health? How to structure mindfulness for multicultural and multi-religious populations? Maybe it's just meditation. Maybe it's, it's, uh, it's forms of yoga in India, for example. There are actually quite a number of questions posed at the end of the paper. So thank you very much. I hope I haven't gone too far over time. And and uh, now I'd like to end here and be open to questions as Dr. Agarwal, Agarwal uh, directs us. So Thank shall you. I stop sharing at this point? Uh, I think um, yeah. I'll put into the chat uh, that DOI and it should be, you can also, if you are interested in seeing the paper, you could find it either on the journal website or uh, my own personal website will have this uh, DOI that you're seeing here. And I'll put that into the chat so that the conference organizers will also have that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Oman, uh, for this enlightening idea about bringing mindfulness into the public health level. Uh, given the amount of work which is happening in mindfulness, people would have just taken for granted that that is like the happening already but um, you showed how it is neglected um, and how we can go further. So uh, I see that you had a couple of questions at the end and um, one of those questions are actually reflected back uh, to you by one of the participants, Will Wilson, that how do you differentiate mindfulness and attentional health? So if you can give your perspective about it, it would be very helpful. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. In fact, I, um, I would, I think that needs more attention. It needs sort of dedicated attention where you look at the, the question in all its richness or what is attentional health. I think that's, that's, I think there hasn't been uh, nearly as much work, but I, I, but what I, what I can say is to me that it seems to be more than simply mindfulness that as i was saying in you know a few minutes ago i would see it as including other things such as uh, concentration that um, that even if someone seems to have be high on some definition of mindfulness maybe kabat sins definition or maybe a more traditional buddhist uh, uh, definition that if they if they have low low concentration maybe they're still lacking something in attentional health and i imagine there could be other factors in fact i i think we uh, somebody some may, maybe among us should take a real careful look at what would be a sensible way to define attentional health. There has been a little bit of work, but I don't think it's been, I don't think it fully answers the things that we would want to know for our purposes. Thank you, uh, Professor Oman. We also have two questions for, for Professor Bhavo. 
One is about how can you, uh, Alka Pandey asked, like, how can you differentiate sukha and well being concept in Bhagavad Gita? For example, equanimity in relationship, um, I think, describes both sukha and relationship dimension of well being. So, if you can give your thoughts about it. So, if we are thinking about well being and then Subjective well-being that uh, is basically the uh, allow me to call it a jargon, but it's it's not a bad choice of words. So I'm not criticizing <laughs> the the late professor uh, about the choice of word, but I think he did, he did not want to use a common word like happiness and or sukha, and so he coined subjective well-being. So if you're referring to well-being and then saying how does it uh, differentiate with Sukha. Uh, so basically my response is, is that uh, there will not be a one-on-one -on -one translatable concept. And so we need to, my effort was to present that Sukha has 30 themes only looking at the Bhagavad Gita uh, of the 35 verses that refer to it. But when we start looking at those other words, so Yukta is used in different, different parts and Yukta has its own depth. It's used like 28 times or something. And then Yukta is used for Sukha uh, or is connected. So uh, my uh, to translate sukha as subjective well-being or uh, anything else, but to draw your attention that there is an indigenous thick description. So I'm even kind of going away from um, Clifford Gerd's definition of thick thick description because when a Western anthropologist sees a thick description. It is different from the way an indigenous person sees thick description. And so you can see there are 30 themes that many can be clustered into you know, a full-blown theory, antecedent, construct definition, and consequences. That's what, what a theory is. And, and then there's a nomological network. So I would invite you to think more um, deeply about Sukha rather than just translate it as happiness and then use all the happiness scales like subjective well-being of you know uh, of the late professor so um, i mean he was he, uh, i'm an illinois graduate so i have tremendous regard <laughs> this, this is coming from my alma mater but uh, the point is we need to think through our concepts uh, from our own perspective and without uh, taking anything away from yeah, you know, what uh, uh, we heard about mindfulness uh, and, and no offense meant, uh, but when I think about mindfulness, I don't think about dhyan. Mindfulness triggers different things in my mind. Uh, in Vivek Churamari, Adi Shankar says, mano nashyati yogina. So in the end, a yogi destroys the manas. And that is the tool for mind. I mean, mindfulness, the mind is full, your manas is full, but we want to, you know, destroy the manas. And the way I would visualize it is when the manas becomes internally focused, then it the buddhi takes precedence. And then you look at the self or atman or the non-self, if you think from the Buddhist perspective, that there's nothing there. But the point is you are getting from the world. So my yogina has that destruction of mind. So we need to be, you know, trade really carefully. And I think uh, uh, we heard how mindfulness now is already established in the Western literature. And now if we start with mindfulness, then we are going to basically, uh, you know, go backward because mindfulness came from the Buddhist tradition. So sati came from smriti, but now we are going from mindfulness to smriti, and that 
completely does disservice to the construct. Nothing to take away from all the empirical work that has been done. And so focusing on the question, please do not think about a one word translation of Sukha. It is a complex construct with multiple you know, correlates, uh, covariates, and we need to understand that in a more complex way. I hope that answers that question. Uh, if not, you can send me an email. I'm bhabuk at hawaii.edu. I'll be happy to you know, email or talk to you on WhatsApp. Uh, Dr. Agrawal. Yeah. So, Professor Bhavuk, there was another aspect to this question about relationship and um, sukha, relationship dimension in the sukha, and whether equanimity can uh, like na, bring both of these things together. So, again, equanimity is sticking to Bhagavad Gita, Samatvam Yoga Uchyate. It's a fundamental definition of yoga. So, now how do you define Samatvam? So, this is where uh, one of our colleagues has done her dissertation on it and she uh, you know, analyzed all the verses in the Bhagavad Gita uh, to again provide a thick description. So Samatthu, as a native, we, you know, we have an intuitive sense of what Samatthu means. And then you can think about you know, Samatthu in happiness and sorrow, Samatthu in cold and hot, Samatthu in man and apman, and all that does capture uh, what is Samatthu. And so now, Sukha has one aspect that, and there is, you know, uh, like uh, uh, authentic Sukha. Um, sukha also has gradation <coughs> in Chandogya Upanishad where, you know, the happiness of a person and happiness of a Deva and happiness of, and so, you know, it's like how many thousand times it multiplies. So we also have that depth, which is not in the Bhagavad Gita, but I think we are still referring to the same construct. So equanimity is basically, Samatvam is going beyond Sukha Dukha. But we didn't need to understand Sukha. And Sukha is a Sattvic Guna. So when we, <clears throat> so, and that we have to cultivate. So we don't want to cultivate Tamasik. We need Rajasik to be effective in the world. And then we need to cultivate sattvic gun. So sukha is related to sattva. But beautifully, I didn't get to explain this, but sattva gun ties us with sukha. Sattva gun ties us with knowledge, with jnana. So we have to be even careful about, you know, attachment to jnana. And, you know, in Ishopanishad, we talk about vidya and avidya. And vidya can become a bigger burden on a person than a vidya. So people have, Manishis have reflected on this deeply. And basically all I can say is we need to be careful. So samatvam is going beyond sukha and dukha, being in harmony all the time, in man and apman, in salt and praise. In fact, one of the definition of a Brahmin in uh, Manusmriti and you know, even if you want to burn Manusmriti, I would want to take a few pearls from there. And so one of them is Sammana the Brahmano Nityam Uddujet Vishadiva Avamanas Sammana the Brahmano Nityam Uddujet Vishadiva. So the Brahmin should reject Samman and welcome insult as nectar. So, so you can see that this will require that samatva. We have to go beyond, uh, you know, appreciation of other people. And this is, by the way, not only in the book, uh, the Swami Narayan uh, group, some thrown stones at and abused, you'll keep going back till this <clears throat> start welcoming you and then you'll stop you. So we can see that there is th this, what is in the Upanishad
have we lost uh, professor has Babu? been translated as a samatom did you not hear me no no the last sentence i think uh, there was some internet issue oh, i said the, did I, I hope i answered that question yes 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 about samatom yes sir. Uh, there are two questions for uh, Professor Oman. Um, basically, I will club together uh, due to shortage of time. Is one is what the studies which have already been uh, conducted in mindfulness and public health. What are they showing, and how can we utilize this information for uh, like a public health in a um, developing country like India, Professor Oman? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, I, there are only a few scattered studies of, of mindfulness in the public health literature in journalists that, um, um, you know, journalists that are dedicated to public health in that category. And uh, I'm, to tell you the truth, I can't quite remember. I don't think any of them uh, had particularly dramatic findings. Um, but I, I guess um, so. So I mean, I could, in fact, if if the person uh, emails me, uh, they can. I think they can find my email at uh, uh, my uh, my website or anyway faculty webpage. Uh, I could send you more, in, and I think also the the paper, the forthcoming paper out within twenty four hours, should give details. Uh, but let me shift to the other question, which maybe is more imaginative of what could it look like in India? So that might be my, you know, so what would I imagine? Uh, I have, I haven't spent lots of time in India, but I have, per, have personally have had an Indian spiritual teacher. So I have some, some familiarity with Indian culture. And uh, I guess my, um, my, in my imagination, uh, in India, there could be, uh, well, I think you've already undertaken some of it, integrating across sectors. My understanding is there has been uh, there's been um, uh, uh, work of uh, uh, university level courses in Indian psychology uh, that include uh, meditation components that can be locally adapted. So that's an example of one particular sector an education sector integrating uh, sort of uh, local analogs. I think they're very rough analogs, but they're local analogs to many of the, you know, of what's been called mindfulness in the West. Uh, that's this sort of bundle or cornucopia of many different practices. So Indian variants of those in across different sectors in the education sector, maybe in healthcare. Uh, uh, maybe in uh, workplaces. Uh, so those would be uh, Indian examples uh, of how one might integrate positive psychology. Not, I'm hearing some beeping. I'm not sure why that's happening. I'm going to ignore it. Uh, and then um, I think in India, as in maybe any other country, you could it could either uh, embrace the need for multi-level interventions and do things about the social environment uh, to try to have it or the attentional environment collective attentional environments to have it be less fragmenting of our attention or uh, or just ignore that and have have the emphasis be primarily individual i think to have it be fully integrate the contemporary public health perspective there would be a way that you'd want to uh, want to inter, uh, intervene on the collective level so that people are intentionally healthy. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what that would be like in India. I, I imagine it you'd you'd want to probably social media because that's a worldwide challenge because the the technologies in social media are purposely designed to capture and hold our attention and stop us from attending to other things that are offline. Uh, I think that's really a frontier for the whole world is what to do about that. And um, I have only a few paragraphs on it, but I, the paper cites uh, a lot of key 
um, publications to sort of get a get an initial sense of what the literature on that is about. And it, it's actually quite, I find it frightening that uh, the power of the social media is sort of overwhelm our, our attention and capture it. Um, so, so I think it, it'd be great if India could address that as, as I think it'd be great if every other country could address that. I mean, I should stop there. Thank you, uh, Professor Oman, for um, this answer. It leads us to many questions in our mind. How do we take it further like at the public health level, some of these ideas? And I thank both Professor Bhavuke and Professor Uman for such enlightening sessions where we uh, went into detail of such uh, nuanced understanding of both uh, happiness Sukha, from the Indian perspective and also about the mindfulness at the public health level. As they say uh, in the Nati Shastra that all the emotions uh, do merge at the end in Shanti. So, um, and even in Bhagavad Gita, when they talk about witnessing the Sakshi, uh, also talks about watching our sensory experiences, watching the, this dynamic interplay of all the gunas of Sattva, Tam, Rajas and Tamas. And in some of the traditions, it goes further deeper to uh, in the Indian uh, tradition that like, uh, who is watching? So also look at not only what you are watching, but also then ask the question, who is that watching? Because that goes to the deeper question about the self, that um, Atman. So um, I hope many more people will be able to take these constructs in their research. Uh, it has been so inspiring. And I hope we can keep having such interactions in future. So I thank the organizers Professor uh, Kamlesh and her team for uh, such a wonderful panel. And um, I thank once again, Professor Bhavuk and Professor Oman for such wonderful talks and all the audience also for their um, relevant questions, which like uh, help us to go more, more deeper into the constraints. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure having you all. Thank you so much.